Welcome to Lifeline Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us this afternoon as we pray together as we study God's Word. We're in our midweek time of prayer and our midweek time of Bible study, and we want to thank you for participating today. I especially want to thank Josh Basic for taping us and Joshua Townsend for yes. joining us today. Thank you. thank you for being here with us. I know that uh, you uh, are a Christian husband and daddy and that you're a uh, reverend and that you work with the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home. And, and the last couple of Sundays you've been preaching. Yes. And I know that November is a busy month for the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home. So tell us a little bit about November and why it's such a busy month for the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home. Please. Yes, we're Typically in November for the children's home, a number of churches take up a Thanksgiving offering. Uh, churches will either take up a, a Mother's Day offering for the children's home or a Thanksgiving offering for the children's home. But as we know, during these days of COVID, a lot of churches shut down over Mother's Day, so they were unable to do that. So a lot of them have pushed that to, uh, to Thanksgiving. So we have an opportunity, an invitation uh, from a number of churches to go and speak in those congregations just exactly what the children's home is doing and how they're connected to the Ministry of Arkansas Baptist Children's Homes all across the state. And Lifeline has always been an Arkansas Baptist Children's yes. Home church, and we've always enjoyed giving uh, to the Thanksgiving offering, and we're doing that. And so we're uh, going to be passing out our uh, giving envelopes, and we have the bookmarks that you gave us, and, and people will receive those as they enter in and exit out of Lifeline. Yes. And so if you want to give to the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home, and I know that you do, when you come in on Sundays, you'll find those special envelopes, and you will have a bookmark to remind you of the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home. Last week, you talked to us a little bit about the young man that's hiking. Tell us a little more about that. Yes, Jeremy Woodall is his name. He's an ex-Army Ranger, and, and I'm sure that helps. It doesn't hurt uh, to, to have that on your resume when you're doing this because he's hiking the entire Washita Trail, which I believe, again, is roughly 225 miles that he is hiking. And he's doing that to raise awareness and funds for the children uh, that are in the care of Arkansas Baptist Children's Home and the foster children that are also uh, under that care. He is the BCM director, the college campus director down in Monticello uh, for Arkansas Baptist State Convention. So he has been on the trail almost a week and a mm -hmm. half now. And so hopefully, if everything goes according to plan, he will end up at Pinnacle uh, State Park near Little Rock uh, Saturday, I believe. Well, let's pray for the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home today and for yes. their Thanksgiving offering. Let's pray yes. right now, okay. please. God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for Joshua Townsend. And God, I thank you for the way that he represents the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home, but most of all, that he represents you, not only in his personal life with his wife and with his three children, but as he represents you, as he preaches your word, as he serves the patrons of the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home. God, I pray you'd bless him. But God, I pray that you'd be with Mr. Woodall as he is doing this walk and this hike for the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home. I pray that you'd bless the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home Thanksgiving offering, and I pray that you'd use it for your glory and for your glory only in the lives of these children. God, as Arkansas Baptist, we are privileged to have this children's home and, and the men and the women that you use to serve the children's home. And I pray that you'd bless not only the children, but those that are serving and working and the house parents and all the people that are involved in the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home. And I pray, Lord God, because of our giving, that more children have an opportunity to find lodging and to find Christian biblical values in our Arkansas Baptist Children's Home than ever before. God, we love you and praise you and thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. As we pray together tonight, also we're going to be reminded of our prayer list. And I know it's the afternoon, but we think about it being evening. Let me go over our prayer list here at Lifeline. In just a few moments, I'll ask you to pray for these folks on our list and those that are sick and afflicted. Lindy Broyles recuperating uh, from his surgery. Brian Davis in need of a kidney transplant. And Kelly Taylor in need of a kidney transplant. Peggy McKelvin is in the hospital we need to remember to pray for her. G.W. Short is in the hospital. We need to remember to pray for him. Paula Gafford, gastroparesis. Ernie Spears, Midtown Rehab. Michael Terry, battling cancer. Teresa Kelly and her sickness. Toby Burnett with COVID. Jimmy Hardiman, Sandy Rockwell's brother-in-law with COVID. Uh, we continue to pray for Jim Fowler and uh, then Jim Romine, Ann Romine's husband. Ray Moore, who's had COVID and recuperating. 
Bill Wall, Wonder Ryden's brother-in-law, Alice Oliver, Ann Romine's mother, my uncle, Jesse Dial, very ill with cancer, Elijah, my nephew, Elijah Ritter with uh, COVID as well. And then also tonight, we're praying for the family of Dale Condry. Miss Dale passed away. We do not know for sure when her services are going to be, but they're going to be for the family. It's going to be graveside services, so please remember that. Then we had some prayer requests from our website, and uh, Teresa Carlton Harville, uh, and pray uh, for that family, for their marriage. Beth, pray for her daughter and her friends, and these folks need God's guidance. And then we have some uh, folks that are struggling, uh, to, and we want to lift them up, some unspoken requests that have been yeah. brought to us. So let's pray for these. Would you pray for these folks, please? Yes. And, and let me remind you, if you have a prayer request, please let us know. We have a team that meets on Tuesday nights and pray. Uh, they either meet virtually or in-house, and we want to pray for you. Our telephone number is 501-568-5433, or you can reach me at myself, 501-529-2324, or you can put your prayer request on our website. We believe in prayer. Matthew 18, 19 says, says if two ask in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. And yes. I know you believe in prayer. Absolutely. Let's pray together tonight. Yes. In the name of Jesus, we just come before you. And I just pray that whenever this is heard, um, maybe across the airwaves, that at any point, uh, if it's being even replayed in the future, that uh, whoever hears this would know that they are being prayed over, Father. Yes. And they would feel that your presence and your grace is amongst them. And we have so many that are recovering uh, from the hospital and from surgery and from procedures. And we have some that are going in and having those presently done. Uh, we have some that are just really wanting to make sure that their family is binding together under the name of Christ. And we know how Satan would love to attack that and uh, disintegrate that family even more. And so all these requests that we bring uh, before you and all those names that were mentioned, Father, we just pray, even the unspoken ones, we just pray, dear Lord, that you would act in a way uh, that is unusual, that it is in a way that is abundantly clear that you are acting amongst them. And I just pray for uh, abundant hospitality to surround these people yes. who are going in into surgery, out of surgery, recovering from surgery, whatever it may be, and all the unspoken requests as well, and all of the family needs that are there, Father. I just pray uh, in your holy and precious name that they would be met and that your love would just permeate mm -hmm. those walls of those homes uh, that would just come out of their lips and mouth and that, that your word would be the center of all of that. And we ask all of these things in the gracious and loving name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Let me remind you again, if you have a prayer request, please let us know. We believe in praying. And as we come together tonight, we're talking about God's call. And this is the last part of our study. And we're going to hit two points tonight. We've talked about God's call to salvation, mm -hmm. God's call to worship, God's call to family, and God's call to church, God's call to ministry. And tonight we're going to talk about God's call to career. Yeah. We talked about that briefly at the end of our session last week, and you had said that there were multitudes of people probably interested in that or alluded to it, and that some people had talked with you about a, a career yes. and about a call to career. And so when we think about our worldview, and especially today if people do not have a biblical worldview and we're never here to condemn and we realize that we deal with people every day that may not have the biblical worldview even that we sure. have or may not even have one at all. And when they're focused on a career, they're focused on an income because they like to eat mm -hmm. and because yeah. they want to pay their bills, we think about the career and, and sometimes the career becomes more than it should be because we've not taught better from a, a church perspective or a biblical perspective. Mm -hmm. So when we think about a career and a call to career, as we think about that tonight and we think about what God's doing in our career, let's talk just a little bit about our, our first inclination to career. What does that look like? I mean, yeah. we ask little children, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. And so what did you think, but prior to God's call in your life, what did you think God was calling you to do prior to your life uh, outside, of, uh, outside of being a, a minister or preacher of the gospel, working the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home, what did you think that God was calling you to do career-wise, career, uh, career -wise, even as a young man? As a young man, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. You know, I always liked uh, law enforcement as a young man, as a young kid. I thought, you know, that's just a fascinating uh, career, and I, I still believe that, actually. I have a 
great deal of respect for those that are yes. in law enforcement. Yes. A uh, great deal of respect for those that are in and around law enforcement and support that. Anyone that's upholding uh, the justice and the line of society, I just have a tremendous amount of respect for. And I find it fascinating as well. So as a young man, I was looking at that. Um, when I when I realized that that's probably not the career path I would be on, then it was more of a like a sales uh, and marketing background that I thought, well, this is probably my niche uh, because I just wanted to interact with people, and and I really enjoyed that aspect, getting to meet uh, just people from all over, and uh, and just really find out what's important to them, and then hopefully match them with whatever product and or good or service we That's were good. providing. I just found that fascinating. That's good. Yeah. Well, they, for me, as long as I can remember, I've enjoyed houses. Mm -hmm. My dad, my uncle uh, would uh, work on houses, build houses in their spare time, if they had spare time, yeah. make a little extra money. Mm -hmm. And so I've, uh, I enjoy drawing blueprints and and so I thought that that's what God was going to uh, call me to do, or that's right. what I was hoping that God would call me to do. And still to this day, every Sunday, almost without fail, I go to open houses. Mm. Real estate people may get sick of looking at my face at open houses, but I enjoy them. Yeah. And so I think about what those careers look like and that how sometimes we can, we can be focused on a career mm. and not even think about it being a calling and we've thought about God's call into salvation, and we know all of that begins with God. God's call to worship, family, church, and ministry. And I'm reminded of the uh, words of uh, the uh, Luke, Doctor Luke, in Acts chapter 18, verses one through four. And we're talking about Paul here, Acts chapter 18, verses one through four. He's in Corinth, and it says, "After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila." a native of Pontius, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, uh, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, he came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working for by trade, they were tent makers, and he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. And no doubt we all know, or well, not all, I shouldn't use that word, but we know the Damascus Road story yeah. and that uh, Paul was called out of due time and met mm -hmm. the Lord in, in salvation on the, during the Damascus Road event mm -hmm. story. And so then we understand in this text that he was a tent maker. And so we're reminded of how God works. And, and we know that the, the Bible says that if a man doesn't work, he should not eat. Yeah. And so we know that God has called us to work. God's called us to career. We think about how God called Adam to a career to tend the garden in the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. And we see that God laid that career out for Adam. There have been t times in my early life before I was 18 that I wish that God had been that specific and I could have heard God the way that Adam heard God and said, hey, this is what I want you to do, Jeff. But let's think about these careers and the difference in them. So when you think about God calling somebody to a career outside of, of preachers, we're not talking about preachers at this moment, but when God calls somebody to a career outside of, of, of being a preacher or a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how do you think that the church is equipping people to recognize that call and which career God has called them to? You know, I don't know. I, I don't know that I've ever really uh, encountered that, so to speak. It may be in a general or broad sense. Um, you can see that. And, and if we're equipping a pe people to follow God's will for their lives, yes. then, then I think that's, I have seen that. I have encountered that. But how to navigate that specifically as it, is in regarding a, a career or maybe a career path, I've encountered that very little. Now I have, we have heard uh, the doctrine of vocation, yes. you know, taught in some of our churches, but by and large, I don't know that we're teaching that per se. But I do know a number of churches that are doing a great job of of helping people navigate and find God's will for their life, which is not really a specific will for you, and it's different for me. It's God's will for all of us yes. to be in the center of His will and word, and so. I, by and large, we're doing a good job of that. But as it, if it drills down to um, walking that out, um, I don't know that I've encountered that a lot because that's really 
uh, happens in discipleship, I think, mostly. But yes. what about you? One-on-one -on -one discipleship is important, mm -hmm. and I think that that's where it should happen. I don't know that it does. I don't remember as a young man growing up in church people talking to me about, hey, what is God calling you to do with yeah. your life? Right. Until one day I was running, and a friend of mine asked me that, hey, Jeff, what's God calling you to do with your life? And I can remember it like it was yesterday. For the first time, yeah. I voiced, God's calling me to be a preacher. Wow. And it scared me to death. Yeah. And, but I do not think that a lot of times we think about that just as, as right. we teach people to we teach people that they're sanctified by the word of God in prayer, First Timothy 4 or 5, right. and that everything is good and profitable by God. We sanctify it through the word of God in prayer. But I don't know that we teach people how to seek that out, especially right. young people that have been in church all their life and they're getting ready to go to college, and we say to them, are you going to the college that God wants you to go to? Are you going to go to the university that God wants you to go to? Are you seeking the career that God wants you to seek? Are you going to be fulfilled in that? Is that going to make you happy? Is it going to yeah. fulfill the will of God in your life? And ultimately, at the end of the day, is it going to bring glory to God, your career? And we know that it should bring glory to God. Sure. I don't know that we formalize that and execute it, and that's why... For me as a pastor, it's important for us to say, well, from the time a baby is born until they get to the fifth grade, we should teach them the Word of God. The yeah. 66 books of the Bible, the individuals that God used to write the books and the specific Bible stories, and then from sixth grade to twelfth grade, we should teach them to apply the Word of God mm -hmm. so that when they graduate from high school, then we're teaching them to live the Word of God because whether they graduate and they go to college or university or they immediately move to a career, we call it college and career, right. whatever they move to, we've got to teach them at that point they need to be ready to live for God and to apply that to a career. What does that look like? And so you have three children, I have two. And so how do you plan to prepare your children for that? If we were talking about my children, your children, how would we teach them to seek out God's will for the career? What would you tell them to do? Well, I would I would tell them to make sure, uh, make sure the priority and the filters are right. So yes. I don't want them to filter out what God's plan is for, for their life through some college and career seminar. You know, I don't want to take a worldly filter and then filter the Word of God through that, meaning this is what the world says you need to do with your life. Now take the Word of God and strain it through that filter and then see what you get and go and do that. I want them to take the Word of God and what He has been mm -hmm. doing and saying and revealing in their life through uh, other people, not just personal revelation, and that's the sieve, that's the filter. And then they take college and career and all that the world says and they apply it and they push it through that filter yes then see what comes out yes and so that's what i would want them to do in a practical sense uh that's going to take a lot of living life together because it's going to take you know you and uh you know pastor josh and a lot of people that that would know us and observe our family and are able to identify traits in the children and how god's using them and uh raising them and and, and what he's doing in their life to also come around and help be kind of a, a council of witnesses to, to help us form that, uh, help identify that, to see how God is speaking amongst his, his church. We talked about the ecclesia, the, the, the group, the body of, of believers. So it's, it's going to take that, I think, larger body, which is so important for us to be in community in the first place, one of the reasons, uh, to help us identify and navigate that using the Word of God and His will as the ultimate filter, yes. not the world. So. Yes, and I like that concept, I, and I, I like that we're talking about that because a lot of the times we, we have filters, but it's not the Word of God, it's not the people of God, it's yeah. not the church of God, and I like that concept. When we think about that, I'm reminded of some other scriptures as well. And when we get into where, where, how God is leading us and what God is uh, saying to us in these scriptures about career, and ultimately what that looks like, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 8, Knowing whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And we talk about the slave man or the free man, and basically in this scenario, we're talking about the uh, the boss or and the laborers, and we, we kind of see how that works. And as we submit to lordship, then we submit to one another. In if we're married in marriage, if we have kids to as parenting, and then to the people that we work for. 
And I deal with a lot of people today that will that will flat tell me I'm miserable because I'm not I'm unhappy with where I work. I work there eight hours a day, uh, five six days a week sometimes, and I'm miserable. And so we have a lot of people that seem to be unhappy because they're not in the career that they believe that God wants them to be, and that makes them unhappy. And they can't find themselves in a position to say, okay, you know, I need this money. I need this paycheck. I can't quit and go and do this. So in that respect, we have a lot of work to do in our New Testament churches to help people find their niche. And where God's calling them, like you said, the filter of the Word of God and prayer, leading them to do what God's calling them to do, realizing that then and only then they're going to be happy. And if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and they're doing it right, they're going to receive a reward for that. We call that the wage. And yeah. we understand payment. We understand what it means to get paid. Even a child understands mm-hmm. that. But when we what when we think about people that are unhappy in their jobs and they do not think that they're working where God wants them to work, how would you address that? Well, my one of my first pastors here in Little Rock once said, "Never quit." He was over the college and career or young marriage, whatever we were called at the time. He said, "Never leave a job uh, because." Immediately he said, don't leave a job because it's not going well or you're unhappy there because you will short circuit what God is wanting mm. to do in your life. And I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting, but what if you're really miserable? And I mean, the principle I think he was trying to teach us is let God work through you in that circumstance because what he will do, that can be a refining circumstance yes. where a lot of things are stripped away because you're not necessarily working to please that boss that person because they may not be a good boss they may not be a good person but ultimately if you're doing like what Ephesians 6 8 is if you're working for the Lord first and not that boss necessarily not to be irreverent or disrespectful to those in authority over us but if you're working for the Lord first well then that's that's how we measure our obedience not necessarily to to that individual that's above us Although, that's not to say we stay in an abusive place, we don't stay in a place that's harmful for our family. It's not right. saying any of those things. This is just talking about that, that those forms of irritation that come uh, in a workplace, or it may just be not the environment we feel like is we just want to be in. But God can certainly work in those, just like the, he references the slave. That may have not, uh, you know, slavery had a different sense, I know, in the ancient days, and it actually propelled some up if they became part of the family um, but that's not the ideal place because you're at the bottom uh, of the totem pole or yes. however you want to view that the hierarchy you're at the very bottom um, so he, I think he's trying to point out a, a, just a proper orientation of who we're working for yeah, that we work for the Lord yeah and not for men and that we're doing what we do and whatever we do whenever yeah. we do it however we do it right. that we're doing it for God I like the phrase that you use, short, short circuit. I think that a lot of times we do try to, we allow ourselves to become pawns in short circuiting the will of God for our lives. We believe in the sovereignty of God, that God's called us to salvation, that God's called us to worship, that God's called us to family, God's called us to ministry, that God's called us to church. And we think about the sovereignty of God and ultimately if God has me somewhere, and in that position, I come to a realization, I do not need to be here. Yeah. Then I need to wait on God to move me instead of me moving yes. myself. I need to be in the center of God's will. And I think a lot of times we do do just what you were talking about, short circuit yeah. maybe God's will for our life or what God's t- trying to teach us through these things. And when we come back to Ephesians, we think about our reward, that we're going to be rewarded. It may not look like the world's reward, but it looks like God's reward. Well, how would you tell someone to balance that so if they're thinking I don't want to be here in this position and, and again we're not talking about abuse we're not right. talking about something that's harmful to them physically emotionally spiritually we're just talking about this it's not the right fit and it's and it may be something that somebody maybe is being um, unkind or something like that but to that degree how would you tell people to balance that I'm not happy here and I believe it's not ultimately where God called me to be Yet I want to wait on God. Yes. How do you do that? For, for me personally, what I have always tried to do, and I don't know why, I don't know where I came up with this number. I, I do believe that the that there are biblical numbers of significance, but I don't. I do not spend a lot of time on that. But for me personally, I I've never heard God the way that you hear me. 
I prayed that God would speak to me the way that I'm speaking to you and the way that I hear you. But I always pray, God, I want you to speak to me and I want you to show me what your will is for my life. And so I make me a list of 10 reasons why God wants me there and 10 reasons why God would not want me there. And so, and then after I make that list, and especially after being married, I would have my wife to make a list, 10 reasons why God would want us here, 10 reasons why God would not want us here, whatever it was. At early in our ministry, I worked at a drugstore uh, to make ends meet, and I had, and made a list, 10 reasons why I should work there, 10 reasons why I should not. At the same time, Pam worked at a pizza hut. We made 10 reasons why Pam should work at the pizza yeah. hut, and 10 reasons why Pam should not work yeah. at the pizza hut. And because we needed to make living, and we needed to make a living because right. we believed if you didn't work, you didn't eat. We weren't going to expect anybody else to do that. We wanted to be in God's will. And so then I pray about that and lift it up in prayer, and then I find scriptures as to what does God want me to do. Now, I know you can't find a specific scripture every time, and I hear pe preachers especially say, well, read the Word of God and find what the Bible right. says about it, but you can't find a, a scripture about every specific res uh, every specific situation, but as a resident, uh, wherever I'm at in my life, mm -hmm. and wherever I'm at in my marriage, or wherever I'm at in my career, whether I'm a pastor, or whether I'm working in, in the workforce in, in, in the field today, mm -hmm. then I can listen to God and say, okay, God, show me through your word what you want me to do. Does this measure up? Is there anything that doesn't measure up with God's word about this job or what I would be doing? Praying about it, having my Pam and I always pray together, having family, close friends, accountability partners, confessional discipleship partners that would pray with me through this, and then ultimately making my list. Ten reasons why God would want me to do that, ten reasons why God would not want me to do that. I still do that today. Yeah. If I'm trying to make a decision, I go back and I make my list, and I'm reminded of that because uh, and when I think about that, Colossians 3, 23 through 25 says it this way. Whatever you do, do your work heartily <laughs> with your heart. Yeah. Now, we think about it is what God's called me to do, is it right with my heart? And we, we talk about Romans 2.22 that uh, Jews were Jews because they were circumcised outwardly. Christians are Christians because they're circumcised inwardly. So is, is God, what does God say to my heart, the inside? Uh, it is, am I doing it with my heart as for the Lord uh, rather than for men? Or am I doing this for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance? Again, it goes back to Ephesians. We're going to be rewarded if we're in the God's will. It is the Lord... Christ, and I find it interesting that Paul says this in Colossians, it is the Lord, he uses the word kurios, and then Christ, whom you serve. And sometimes we forget, especially if we're working in a worldly place where people do not talk like God, where people are not reading scriptures yeah. from God, and where it's not the friendliest place to work, it's not the happiest place to work, and our heart's mm. not there, and we dread getting up and going of the morning. Mm. And I've always said as a pastor, if I had to dread getting up and going to church, I wouldn't go to that church very long. Mm. If I had to dread coming in and worshiping there, I wouldn't want to worship there very long. I wouldn't want to serve as the pastor there. And I think that the same would be for me in my life in the workplace. If, if I had to dread that, my heart wasn't in it, I, I dreaded coming, I feared coming, that would not be a good thing for me. And go back and ask God why. Okay, God, what are you showing me? What does this look like? And then ultimately going back and saying, okay, for he who does wrong will receive the consequence of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. And I think that we have to be real careful in our workplaces, even in churches, not to show partiality. I think that we have to be real careful even in our families not to show partiality. Sure. And so I have a son and a daughter, and my son teases me about showing partiality mm -hmm. in the church place we can't, in the workplace we can't. And, and we reminded, we're reminded that James says in James chapter yeah. 1 that Jesus, that God doesn't show partiality. Mm -hmm. And so we go back to the workplace of what does that look like, and are we going to receive a reward? Now, and ultimately... If God doesn't want us there, then God will move us from that. Wouldn't you agree? If God doesn't want me there, then God will move me from that position? Yes, ultimate. Well, yes, if he does not want us there, then ultimately I believe he will, he will move us out. Although I would say we need to be careful about putting timetables on the Lord. We can't put timetables yes, on God, and I'm glad you brought that up. That, yeah. And that ultimately that God will move us out, but we have to ask, what is God teaching me in the meantime? And that's what I would ask you too. When you, when you, this does point out, do this with your heart. 
What if someone says, ah, you know, my heart's just not in this. How would you distinguish heart and emotions too? Because sometimes we just have negative emotions about it. And how do you balance that? Well, I'm real cautious with negativity. Mm -hmm. And and our church knows this. My family knows this. For me, if it's chaos and confusion Mm -hmm. and there's negativity, then I have to assume that I'm outside of the will of God, Mm -hmm. especially if I'm the source of that chaos or confusion or negativity. Mm -hmm. And that, I, that I'm outside the will of God because the Bible teaches us to be a respecter of all people. And today in our society, I think that we get the heart and emotions sometimes flipped. We, we want to turn those around. And just because we don't feel like it, right. then we say, well, it's right. okay for me to have an attitude. Or it's okay yeah. for me to be rude. It's never okay for me to be rude. It's never okay for me to have an attitude. Yeah. And uh, I, I was somewhere the other day where somebody yelled at somebody that they were, we were in, in a restaurant and there's a new person taking an order. And these people were yelling at this poor new person taking this order. And I thought, oh Lord, God, thank you that I do not have to endure that. And so when I got up there, I said, I, I just apologize for all the people that have ever yelled at you. Mm-hmm. And, and I think about in my ignorance and sometimes in pride and in boastfulness that we treat people bad. There's never excuse for bad. And so if, we're, if we find ourselves in a place that, that's not, uh, you know, not necessarily that we know that this, hopefully this is not where God's going to leave me, but it's while I'm here, yeah. then we, ha- we better act the way God wants us to act mm-hmm. even then, in, in, in the midst of that. And, and we've got to do that because we've got to be in God in the center of God's will. And we know that God will repay even the bosses for doing a bad job, according yeah. to this scripture. And that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God does not need me to get back at one person. Mm-hmm. God's going to take care of everybody in his way. That's God's job. My job is to live for the Lord in the midst of that. Mm-hmm. I think about that as a pastor. I think about all the staff that I've worked with in these years and think about how many times did I lose my anger and I shouldn't have lost my anger. How many times was I rude or ugly or or seemed uh, prideful or boastful? And there's never any excuse for that. And then I think about the times that that Satan, and and it goes back to Satan because I can't blame anybody else unless I blame myself. It, but it goes back to Satan. How many times Satan tempts us with being angry and tempts us with being negative and tempts us with being hateful and, and talking down to somebody or being rude or ugly to somebody, and there's never any excuse for that. And then when I realized that and realized that in my own life, that I would find myself in those positions, then it dawned on me, you know, I'm the one who's in sin. I'm the one who's going to have to pay for that. For this, and ultimately, I'm the only one really that it's affecting because most people aren't affected by other things mm-hmm. as much as as we are. And I go back and think, well, why did I get angry? Why did I let that make me so angry or so unhappy or so negative or mm-hmm. or, or 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 worry or anxious? When when I believe in the God's sovereignty, and just like we've looked at in all these, God calls us to salvation. He calls yeah. us to worship. He calls us to family. He calls us to uh, ministry. He calls us to church. And so he's going to call us to a career. And if God's called me to a church or God's called me uh, early in my, the first job I ever had was taking duckweed off of ponds. And, and you know why? It was a real glamorous job because yeah. the sewer treatment center wanted the duckweed for the sewer system. Right. And every time I'd get on a boat and take it out in the middle of the lagoons, I would pray, oh, Lord, God, please do not let this boat tip over. I do not yeah. want to fall in. If and, any and, boat has yeah. ever survived, let this yeah, yeah, survive. Let, this yeah. survive. let yeah. me not fall in. Yeah. And and then I painted, I, one, well, one of my first jobs up there before that was painting fire hydrants. And I mean, that you know, the only people that had more fun with the fire hydrants were the dogs that used yes. them that shouldn't oh, yeah. have been right before I got there. Right. But I, I think about what that looks like. And if God wants me to do that, then I'm willing to do that. Just like as a pastor, uh, I can't be, you know, I, as a pastor, wherever God's called me, I need to find contentment there until God moves me. If I go back and believe in the sovereignty and the call of God and that God's called me to a career. Now, again, God never wants us to put up with abuse. But I say to us as Christians, God doesn't want me to lose my temper. God doesn't want me to be angry. God doesn't want me to be negative. There's never, and I've made excuses. Many, Many years in my life, I would make excuses for, well, this person did this. Anybody in their right mind would be angry or upset about that. But it's not anybody in their right mind. It was Jeff. And he wasn't in his right mind. It reminds and, me, it seems like when the scripture says the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And I think about that. It's like, you know, even when I've tried to be righteously angry, and there is there is a sense of righteous anger, and that's a whole different topic yes. to unpack. Because that's difficult for man to hold on to righteous anger. I don't know that we've 
ever done that well. No. But trying to use anger as a justification or even as a tool to produce something that you think may be righteousness. Usually we're not trying to produce righteousness. We're trying to produce vengeance. But I think if we're using anger as a tool, it, number one, it's a weapon we can't wield at all very well. Yes. Uh, but it doesn't ultimately produce what God wants, is, which is the righteousness in that person, the godly righteousness. But, well, and I think we have to be very mindful of that when we live in a world that 50% claim Christ, 50 to 60%, depending on which calculations you go on. I'm, I'm not a, try not to be too much into statistics because I know that God in his resurrection power can override any statistic. But when we think about our workforce and we think about what God's doing in the workforce and that a number of the people that we're working with or that we come in contact with in the workplace, if we're a Christian and they may not be a Christian, we may be the only picture of God that they ever see. We yeah. may be the only light. You preached a couple Sundays ago about uh, light in the tunnel. Mm. And we may be the only light in their tunnel at yeah. that time that they need to see and, and how much darkness is there. I'm reminded of 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. As each one of us has received a gift, employ it in serving one another. Mm -hmm. Wherever we're working, if we're, whether we seem to be the laborer or the, the boss or wherever we're at, that we serve one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then he addresses those who have been called to just to preach. And we know that Ephesians gave us, Corinthians and mm -hmm. Ephesians gives, gives us a list of spiritual gifts. And we know that God's called some to be preachers and evangelists and mm -hmm. And, you know, you think about somebody may ask me, well, why are you full time at a church? Well, it's because I'm busier than I've ever been in my life, hopefully doing exactly what God wants me to do. Mm -hmm. But in, in Paul's case, somebody could say, well, why aren't you a tent maker and a pastor? Or why aren't you drawing blueprints and, and pastoring? Well, I wouldn't have time to do both. Yeah. And early in my life, I had to make a decision in ministry because I had the opportunity to do both. Mm -hmm. And my dad said to me, did God call you to be an architect or did God call you to preach the word? Mm -hmm. And if God called you to preach the word, you better stick to preaching. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, I told my doctor the other day, I'd let him stick to doctoring and I would stick to preaching. Yeah. And he agreed yeah. that that was a good format. But I think that uh, that we are coming and we're, we're approaching a time in the history of the church where we're going to have more bivocational pastors than ever before. Yeah. We're going to have more pastors that are tent makers or whatever it is that God's called them to do and full-time pastors. And we need to get that figured out. And I'm not afraid to do that. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't bother me a bit to sell real estate or to draw houses or to whatever, yeah. but I want to do what God's called me to do. But I think that he has called some of us and he says, whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterance of God. I better speak what God utters and tells me to speak. Yes. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supp supplies. Mm -hmm. Whichever job you go to uh, tomorrow morning, go to the job that God supplies and go on the supplies of God. And I think about how rich this is. We go to the job that God supplies, but we better go on the supplies or with the supplies of yes. God, what God supplied us so that in all things God may be glorified through Christ Jesus to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And we think about the biblical uh, career and just some tid uh, tidbits that uh, we point out. Jesus had 52 parables and 45 of them dealt with careers yes. other than preachers. 52 right. parables, 45 of them. Think about uh, Acts describes 39 divine interventions, and most of those were in the marketplace. Right. Most of those divine interventions didn't take place in a church place. They right. took place in the marketplace. Right. And then we talked a little earlier, and, and we don't go over uh, our lesson per se, but we talked about how God's call, how God called the 12, and mm -hmm. none of them were preachers. And it, But then you reminded me of the Apostle Paul. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, I was just thinking that the only one that was closest to a preacher was one who was essentially involved almost full-time in religious activity was the Apostle Paul. But he was the one that God got a hold of most dramatically, too. He's the one he, yes. you could argue, humbled the most because he was in that religious activity. But the religious activity was actually going in the opposite direction that Christ was calling him. So he almost had a cleaner slate, you could say, with these guys who had no background in re religious activity, the fishermen, the tax collectors, those that society would have thought would have had the hardest time and the longest walk yes. towards what God was doing, actually had the shortest distance to travel, so to speak, um, because God called
called them and got a hold of their life. And they, he, there was a lot to be reversed and undone in the religious activity of Paul, so much so that he you know, blinded him yes. or the, and, and really humbled him to the point of getting his attention. Well, and then he had a thorn in the flesh the rest yes. of his ministry. And yes. many believe that that thorn in the flesh goes back to him being blinded yes. and that his eye, one of his eyes, or if not uh, both, were infected and yeah. had to have salve, so to the point that it was probably uncomfortable for some people to look at his eyes. Right. I, I, you know, my eyes move back and forth every now and again, and I can tell when people are uncomfortable about that, and they want to ask me, do your eyes always do that? But So I can't imagine the Apostle Paul and his thorn in the flesh and the fact that he had to, he had to go back and undo what had been done in his life by religion. Yeah. And sometimes even in our workplaces we have to do that. And, and, but we think about that we must press forward and keep going because God's called us not only to a career but to the world. Mm -hmm. And as we think about God's call to salvation, God's call to worship, God's call to family, God's call to ministry, God's call to the church, God's call to a career, ultimately that career can take us to the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you think about uh, your career and how you ended up in Little Rock and how you, you worked uh, in uh, in in the hotel industry, hotel yeah. industry and other things, and then ended up in ministry and and being li uh, licensed and ordained and right. serving and working the Arkansas Baptist Children's Home. And think about Christians wherever they're working tomorrow, wherever they get up out of bed and go to work at tomorrow. That they're ultimately they're being called to the world. And we think about the Great Commission, Matthew eighteen, uh, Matthew twenty eight eighteen through twenty. And I love how he starts. After which power you've re I, all power and authority has come upon me, mm -hmm. Jesus says. And then Acts one eight, you shall receive the power. You shall receive power. And we need that power of God wherever we're working, whatever we're doing. And so if somebody's listening to us right now and they say, I'm totally unhappy with where I work, mm -hmm. totally unhappy with my career, totally unhappy with what's going on in, in that aspect of my life, what would you say to them tonight as we take this study and, and we think about ultimately going to the world, go, make disciples, baptize, teach, and ultimately to remember that Jesus is with us until the end of the age. But we're dealing with somebody that's totally unhappy mm. with where they're working. They're totally unhappy with where they're spending 40 hours a week. They're totally yeah. unhappy with what's going on in their life. What would you say to them tonight? What would be the most applicable thing uh, that we could take from these studies and apply to them? What would you say to them tonight? I would say that sometimes that irritation is kind of like a splinter, you know, under your skin or something. The, 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 there's a reason it's inflamed and irritated. And it could be uh, that we've done that to ourselves somehow. Mm. Um, it could be that we've just done it through casual working. That's something God's called us to do. You know, carpenters that are called to carpentry get those all the time. Um, but I would say if, if they're doing that <clears throat> and they're feeling that way, I'm sorry they're in that situation. But I would search the heart and character of God with all that I had. And I would make that my devotion for whatever time. And I would set a time span, not to limit God, but just as an act of devotion and trying to seek the character and heart of God. And then through that, praying that God would reveal his character and his heart in me as it's in me and where it's not. And um, I would also say that people in the secular workplace, they may not believe in God, but they understand wrongdoing. So if there's been wrongdoing occurring to a Christian in the workplace, they recognize that. And there's not really a greater witness than the one who's been wronged living as though uh, they still love others and they still don't seek vengeance on their own. We see this in Christ, obviously. The ultimate wrong was done to him. But that's the greatest witness that anyone has ever seen. And throngs of people have been won over to Christ by yes. seeing others yes. uh, innocently wronged yet not retaliating uh, in, in vengeance or anything like that. So one, I would seek the character and the heart of God, see how that manifested itself in my life, um, have God reveal that to me. And then in the meantime, just attach yourself to that, even in the midst of the wrongdoing, so that others may see the light of God in you in yes. that workplace and environment. Keep going in Jesus. Yes. Yeah, and I, I, we go back and we think about these calls, and these are good check marks. 
If you're seeking God's will for your life tonight, first of all, check your salvation. Make sure that you're saved. Secondly, check your worship. Make sure that you're worshiping correctly so that you're ready for the week. Thirdly, check with your family. Wherever you're at, whether you're married or you're single, check with your family and ask your family, do you feel like that this work is fulfilling me, that I'm fulfilling what I'm supposed to do? Am I content? Am I happy in the Lord? Am I bringing glory to God? Check with your family. Check your ministry. How does this co-work with your ministry, co-mingle with your ministry? Am I getting to do ministry with it? Ultimately, check the church. Is it keeping me from the things of God, or is it enabling me to participate in the things of God? And then ultimately ask God, God, am I doing exactly what you want me to do, when you want me to do it, how you want me to do it? Speak to me. We've talked about showing the writing on the wall, making it as clear as it can be. And so check that. And then ultimately, is it enabling me to go to the world? And ultimately, there are people that you work with that you may be your most favorite people in the world, which you shouldn't have. And then people that you may say, well, these are my uh, least favorite people, which you shouldn't have again. But we realize that there are going to be people that we get along with, people that we do not get along with, people that we can pray with, people that may not want us to pray with them, people that we can talk about God's Word with, people that may not want to talk about God's Word with. But at the end of the day, no one can keep us from praying. So I want to challenge you. I want you to start praying every day for the people that you work with. I want you to put them at the top of your prayer list. After you pray to God about yourself and you pray for your family, your extended family, your friends, your church family, pray for those people that you work with and see if that makes a difference. And then pray to God, God, if I'm not working where I should be working, show me. Let me be in a God-called career. Let me be in a God-called career. As you think about how many hours we spend in a career and how many hours we spend away and that we're preparing our children to choose that. We need to prepare our children to choose the career that God has chosen for them. Yes. That it, 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 it's right up there. It's not as important as the person that God's chosen for them to spend their life with, but it's right up there. Are you doing what God's called you to do? Are you in a God-called career? Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, we all have ministry, and we all should be doing ministry, yeah. but are we in a God-called career? Thank you for joining us tonight. Maybe you've never asked Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, and that's your problem, and you realize it. I want you to go back and read Romans 10:9 that says, Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. And I want you to check your salvation at the door. Then check your worship. And if you've not been saved, you can't worship. And I want you to say to him, Lord God, in Jesus' name, please be the Lord, the boss of my life from this day on. I do believe that God raised you from the dead, giving me resurrection power over sin, resurrection power over death, and the resurrection power to live for Jesus Christ. Save me right now. Save me right now. Not only do we need to do that, but we need to know how to lead others to do that, especially in the workplace. But please remember, you need prayer, please call us. Reach out to us. Thank you for joining us. May God bless you. Have a good rest of your career week, and make sure that you're in a God-called career.